name of God. Praise the name of God, everyone. We are welcoming you to this, our weekly pastoral connect, where I have the pleasure and the privilege of sharing with you out of God's eternal word. This is the day the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I don't know how you feel about it, but I am so grateful to God for his mercy and his grace upon my life, him allowing me to be a part of his kingdom plan. And even right now, no matter what's going on in the world, I'm so grateful that I am on God's mind. You are on God's mind. He's thinking about us right now, and it's something to praise God for. He's never not thinking about us. And every time I consider the fact that God is thinking about me, it makes me feel real good to know that the God of the universe is concerned about me. And as much as he's concerned about me, he's concerned about you as well. So welcome today, June the 13th, year 2023. Let's get before the presence of God with our opening prayer, and we'll dig right into the lesson at hand. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we love you. We thank you. We cannot thank you enough for all the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Lord, I thank you for breath. Thank you that I can breathe. Thank you that I don't have to be connected to machines and medical apparatus. I'm thankful, Lord God, that I can breathe on my own. I thank you that I have the use and the activity of my limbs. I thank you, Lord, for, a, as they say, a reasonable portion of health and strength. I thank you, Lord, that I have a mind to think and a heart to feel. I thank you right now, Lord God, that even in my spirit, I can sense your presence and my soul delights in you. I pray, Lord God, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you will speak a word to us this night, that you will speak a word of faith, that you will bless us and challenge us, that you will charge us and you will comfort us. Lord God, as we speak of comfort, we pray, Lord God, for those that are grieving, those that are sick and going through, those that are heavy laden and burdened. I pray now, Lord God, by the power of your spirit, that they would be lifted as we call on the name of Jesus, that their hearts would be lifted as they call on the name of Jesus, that their healing would manifest as they call on the name of Jesus, that the power of the almighty God would come into the situation as they invite your presence in calling on the name of the Lord. I thank you right now, Lord God, for doing that wonderful work. And whoever needs healing right now, I praise you for it. Whoever needs a touch from you, I praise you right now for it. Whoever needs direction for salvation, I praise you right now for them, those and all of the blessings we ask in the matchless name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, and amen. God bless you again. Welcome to our Bible study. I'm gonna ask you to take a moment, if you will, uh, and just share this out. Um, for those of you that have uh, Facebook accounts, if you could share this out on Facebook and invite your friends and family, invite everybody that you can to be a part of this Bible study tonight. I believe that they'll be blessed and you'll be a blessing to them in Jesus' name. We're going to continue in our Bible study on the promises of God. Um, as I was considering where God is, how God is working right now and how God is moving, that we find ourselves in a situation where there are promises that people have made and promises that people are standing on or holding on to by hope. And we're finding people not coming through with their words. Their hopes, people's hopes are being dashed. People are showing themselves to not be consistent and faithful. Sometimes people will say just enough to get you to do what they want you to do. They'll use conniving words to seduce people into positions of compromise. But I want you to understand the power of God's word. When God says something about you or says something to you or gives you something in terms of a promise in his word, you don't ever have to worry whether or not God is going to come through. God is faithful. And I, I believe that this is one of the things that the Lord wants us to stress to you tonight, the faithfulness of God. As, his, as it relates to his promises. And so our foundation scripture for our lesson is 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. And it simply says, it's right on the screen, for all the promises of God in him, in Christ, 
are yea and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. For all the promises, not some, not a few, not most, all of the promises of God in Christ are yea and in him, amen. There's no vacillation. There's no, I'm thinking about it. There's no ambivalence. There's no doubt or uncertainty. It's full assurance. Every promise of God that's, that's a part of our relationship with Christ, what God has done for us through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, where Jesus died on the cross for our sins so that we might be redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus, not redeemed by corruptible things in this world, but by the precious blood of Christ that was offered for us once as a perfect sacrifice. For by one offering, Christ hath forever perfected them that would be sanctified. His offering is so perfect and so fulfilling and complete that there is no question that it's going to accomplish in us what God intended when Christ died in our stead, our stead, when he took our place on the cross. Christ died for us because we owed a debt we could not pay, and only Christ could pay the debt. He took our place, paid the debt, and when he said, it is finished, the work was done. He finished. It was a finished work. And so now I enter into a finished work. You enter when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. You come to God by faith in Jesus Christ. You enter into a finished work. It's no more work for you. It's time for you to receive. You come to the presence of God by faith and sit so you can receive, glory to God, what God has in store for you. Whew. Let me get into this lesson here. But I'm, I'm feeling something happening even right now. When we come to God by faith, based upon the merits of what Christ has done for us, he that knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. And so Christ took our place. The Bible says um, that, that um, cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. Christ has redeemed us from the curse. To be redeemed means to be brought back. He paid the price and the ransom price to free us from a state of spiritual bondage. God never intended for you to be bound. God never intended for you to be under lock and key or chains of sin. God never made you, didn't make us for that purpose. God made us to praise him, to serve him, to reflect his goodness in the world, to be, to be the recipients of his mercy and his grace the benefactors of his love and the recipients of the benefits of those promises. My God, I, I'm just excited when I think about the position that God has put me in. Salvation puts me back to where God wanted me to be in the first place. Sin got me displaced. Sin will displace you. Salvation puts you back where God wanted you to be. And so when Christ died for us, he took the judgment so we can get the promises of God, the promise of redemption, the promise of the forgiveness of our sins, the promises of healing for our bodies. My God, all of them, whatever the promise is, it belongs to us through Christ. And so my job is to believe God for what he promised through Christ to accept what Christ has done for me repent of my sins, accept the name of Jesus Christ through water baptism. The word baptism comes from the Greek word baptizo, which means to dip, to plunge, or to immerse. And so water baptism by immersion in the name of Jesus Christ, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, Acts chapter 4, verse 12. I know what Matthew 28, 19 talks about, but it said in the name of, not in, and not to be baptized in titles, but to have a name. 
There's a name. When you're dealing with the powers of darkness, the spirit of evil, spiritual wickedness in high places, the only thing that moves them is the name of Jesus. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and demons tremble at the name right now. They're not going to wait until they bow to respond to this name. You call that name right now, demons will respond. You call that name right now, it brings peace. It cancels out the storm and brings the calm. So many, many, many things that's associated with the name of Jesus. Let's get into these promises. I'm feeling something powerful coming up even, even now. So let's go into the lesson. So I want you to understand, when we talked about the lesson last week, there were a couple of things that we shared at a high level concerning covenants, concerning promises. Um, and I just want to remind you of those things. Covenant is an agreement between God and man or God and the nation. It's a pact. It's something that binds. It's a legal binding contract of sorts, if you can, if you will. It, it comes in two forms in scripture, that which is conditional, which depends on man doing something to receive the promise versus unconditional, where the promise comes to us because of God's grace and mercy, un, untied to any act of man completely something that, uh, that was done by God on our behalf. And so we started going through the word of the Lord last week, talking about um, what was the promise attached to the verse. We went through all of these verses last week. And I'm just sharing it here now for those that may not have been with us last week so they can get all of the details of the lesson. But we're going to start with Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. As a matter of fact, I'm just going to share um, the list of verses. So we have all 10 of them here in front of us. So if you would um, just put the number for the verse, we're looking at six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Again, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. The sixth verse is Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 29. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 29. Verse number seven is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 through 10. Verse number 8 is Isaiah 40, verse 28 through 31. Verse number 9 is Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 9. And verse number 10 is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. At this time, I see we've got um, 9, we've got 10. Praise the Lord. I need 6, 7, and 8. Need someone for 6, 7, and 8. Please put those numbers in the chat and we'll proceed accordingly in the name of the Lord. Verse number six, verse number seven, verse number eight. Six again is Matthew 11, 28, 29. Seven is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse nine through 11. And eight is Isaiah 40, verse 28 through 31. Now, I know you're not going to have me do all this reading tonight. So come on, let's be snappy. Got a good number of people in the queue. Got three people already selecting verses. Thank you, Dr. Marbury. Thank you, Missionary Tinley. I just need three other volunteers to come quickly, or so I'm just going to read it. Um, all right, I'm just going to go ahead and read it. Um, Matthew chapter um, 11. So I'm going to go to verse number six. If somebody would volunteer for verse seven and eight, that'd be appreciated. Let's move on. Matthew 11, verse 28 through 29 says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. I think something that is so very powerful today is contained within the promises of this verse, Matthew 11, verse 28 through 29. It, ref it, re it realizes the fact that people are going through things. And I think this, this is something powerful to make note of concerning God's word. God's word is not distant from your experience. It's not disconnected from the experience of humanity. God's word, although written so many years ago, it is living, it is powerful, and it remains relevant. The Lord Jesus Christ in his day spoke to an audience of thousands, and the, he saw the grief of life, he saw the, the struggles of life, 
You saw the different uh, situations that people were going through, different economic statuses, different political statuses. He dealt with people that were sick, um, people that had leprosy, people that were ostracized, alienated, people with issues of blood, parents that had children that were dying or dead. Um, you remember, he stopped the funeral procession for a young man, touched the prayer, caused the young man to come back to life. Went to um, Jarius's house. His 12-year-old daughter lay dead. She was dying. By the time he got there, she was already dead. Word got to him, trouble not the master. She's already dead, that kind of thing. He went anyhow, opened up the door, went in to find a grieving group of people. He told them that the maid is not dead. She's just asleep. And, and soon that fickle crowd that was driven by their emotions as they were uh, at his entrance, they were grieving and sorrowing and weeping, et cetera. The moment he said what he said, they started laughing. So for whatever purpose they were there, I'm not sure, but they certainly weren't there to do anything to help. Um, they were just an audience. And be careful who's in your audience. Everybody that's in your circle, um, they're not looking out for your good. They may just be there for the fishes and the loaves. Who know that whether or not these people that were grieving were there for the refreshments because their attitude certainly showed that they were not there to comfort. And so he tells them all to leave. He goes into the room with um, Peter and James and the parents of the daughter, goes in there, uh, calls her Talitha Kumi, which means a, a maid arise and she gets up. She's whole. The Lord Jesus just did it. And Jesus is doing it. He's doing it on the left. He's doing it on the right. As a matter of fact, he's doing something right now. Somebody needs to put it in your notes. The Lord is doing it. And according to Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 29, he understands the pressures of life. He understands the difficulties of life. And he makes an invitation to all those that are going through. Everyone that's going through. He says, and um, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The promise of the word is that when you come to Jesus, Jesus is going to give you rest. He also goes on to say, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. In other words, when you are yoked to someone, you are connected to them. A yoke is a tool that, 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 um, that brought two beasts of burdens together to pull a plow. And so it would go over the neck of the, of the beasts. And as they went forward, they couldn't go their own direction. They, whatever direction one was going in, the other had to go in. And so they, they were not independent of each other. They were tied together, if you will. And their unity was what made their effort beneficial to the farmer, to the husbandman. They pulled the plow, they pulled it together, and they went forward. But this yoke um, also signifies heaviness. Uh, and, and the truth of the matter is that the yoke was heavy. Um, it was made of wood. It was a big object. And the idea here is that Jesus is identifying with people who are carrying loads who are carrying burdens. And sometimes people go over, they gloss over what they're dealing with, with a colloquialism, some kind of religious catchphrase. Um, and I know that I, I use a phrase that I've become pretty much known by. Um, when people ask me how I'm doing, I would declare the Lord is my strength. Um, and for me, that's no colloquialism. That's, the true, that's one of the most truest statements that I can make. Um, the Lord is my strength. I'm doing what God has given me. I'm loving the life I live. I'm living the life I love, but it comes with responsibility. And you can't take, you can't take the calling for granted because every calling has responsibility on it. My God, somebody needs to hear this. The calling has responsibility and the responsibility is tied to a weight. But this is not the kind of thing that Jesus is talking about here. He's not talking about the weight of responsibility. He's talking about the burdens of life, the cares of life the overwhelming things that drowned out the, the solitude and make it hard to, get, to catch your breath. He's saying, listen, when you come to me, I'm going to do something for you. I want you to connect with me for my yoke is easy. Connect with me. Connect with me. My, take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. Connect. Learning of Jesus is never just an act of mental assent or an exercise in your cognitive skills, the ability for you to know facts and figures. When you talk about learning about Jesus, it's transformational learning. If you are not being changed 
the more you learn about Jesus, then you are approaching Bible study in a, in a totally wrong way. Bible study is designed to not only inform you, but to inspire you for transformation so that you will line your life up with God's word. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. Understanding the gentle nature, the meek, humble nature of Christ, whereas he is absolutely the lion of the tribe of Judah, don't mess with Jesus because Jesus has power. But when it comes down to dealing with those who are heavy and those that are weighted down, he is most gentle. And, I, and I'm going to say this, and we're going to move on to the next verse. Jesus will be to you whatever you need him to be. And he knows what you need him to be. He knows when to be gentle. He knows when to be firm. It's, it's amazing. You got to walk with Jesus to know this. You got to walk with him. You got to walk with him. So I want to encourage you again. Come to him. Relieve yourself of the burden. When you come to him, you give him your cares. Uh, and somebody put down in your notes, sit down sit down. This, this, this verse just encourages me to relax. When I sit down, I take the weight off my legs. I take the weight off of myself and I put the weight on something else. Sit down, sit down, sit down. My, my, my. Okay. Uh, verse number seven, second Corinthians chapter 12, verse nine through 10. Sister Lynette, come on, let's read that. I need, and Sister Carla, Missionary Carla's got eight. Okay, wonderful. Let's go. She, so that you're there. I'm here. All right, dear. God bless so you. Second Corinthians say? chapter 12, verse 9 through 10, please. Right. I'm coming. Say it again. Right, 12, I see it. Sorry, I'm coming. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Everybody else that's coming behind her, please have your verses ready. Oh, that's embarrassing. <laughs> Gotta I'm be coming. ready. Gotta be ready. Okay, when you're tired. Okay. You can handle it. No excuse. You know I'm tired, no excuse. In Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, right? I got it. Verse nine, nine and 10. No, eight. I'm um, seven. Oh, That's the I'm Jesus. Coming. Liz, I'm, I'm sorry. Second like Corinthians chapter 12, right? Verse, verse eight, verse seven. No. No. <laughs> Look at the screen there. Man, Second Corinthians chapter twelve, verse nine and ten. Yeah, but Sister Harvey told me, I, told me to read um seven something. Yes, it's on the screen, dear. Yeah. All right, I'm not gonna write in front of me. Okay, <laughs> nah, I'm not gonna dispute anybody. I, I wouldn't do that. She put seven down because that's verse number seven. That's the seventh verse. Oh, right. Thank you for straightening that out. Appreciate it. Second, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8 in the King James Version. Verse 9. Sorry. Dear, Sorry. Man. Okay, Maybe take it. Take, take a breath. Take a breath. I should read tonight. No, nope, you're going to do it. You're going to do it. Come on. Okay, take my breath. Help me, Father. Okay. Verse 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 in the King James Version. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's right there, dear. Come on. Okay. Come on. <laughs> and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Oh, I need that now. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of christ may rest upon me amen verse 10 
All right, I'm going to read it. <laughs> what the hell is a little challenge? Sister Lynette, bless your heart. Verse 10 says, therefore, I take pleasures in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. You, we are familiar with this passage as the Apostle Paul shares with us what God has allowed to come into his life, essentially to keep him humble. Uh, and it was a thorn in the flesh. It was an infirmity in his flesh. The Bible calls it a messenger of Satan sent to buffet him. Um, Paul was a person of tremendous privilege in the body of Christ, and God had given him many revelations and insights. And one of the things that is certain about the human, uh, human experience is that sometimes when a person starts getting so much notoriety that they forget where they come from, they have so much popularity and fame, they forget the bridge or bridges that brought them to the place that they're at. And so God didn't want Paul to, for, to lose his mind. He didn't want Paul to get caught up in what people were saying about him and the great works that he was doing, admittedly, and the revelation that he had profoundly. Um, and so this is what God allowed to come into his life. But look and see what it is here that he is pointing Paul to. Because Paul had requested three times that the Lord would relieve him of this thorn in the flesh. He made a request three times that God would take it away. And somebody on this lesson tonight needs to hear that Sometimes what God gives you is not relief, but revelation. He gives you revelation instead of relief or release. He did not take away the thorn in the flesh from Paul, but he taught him something valuable. And this is what's contained in these verses, that my grace is sufficient for you. Uh, the King James Version, uh, the old English of the King James says, my grace is sufficient for thee. My loving kindness, my mercy, my, my indwelling presence is more than enough. And oftentimes when we're in pain, we're simply focusing on relief. We're simply focusing on being released from the pain, from the malady, from the situation. And here, this man of God, set apart man of God, he was chosen to take the message of the Gentile world. And he did it, did it in a profound way. But in this case, when he asked God to relieve him of this thorn in the flesh, God said, no. You have to have enough trust in God to accept when he says no. A lot of times people don't want to hear God's no. And they'll go off and do something that God has not given them any permission to do. God has not given any approval to do. God has not given any direction to do. No blessing. And sometimes when you're going down that road and there are problems that erupt, it's simply because you ain't supposed to be there in the first place. You have no business being there. You have no business being connected to this person or to this thing. God has not given you leave to do that. He's not told you to go in that direction. You went off on your own. And anytime you go off on your own, outside of God's will, you bring problems into your own life. Here, a problem came into Paul's life simply because he was following God's will. And when he wanted to be relieved, God said, no, I'm going to give you revelation. Revelation is greater than relief. I don't know if you're ready to, to hear that, but I'm, I'm, I'm giving you some, these are some of the tough set sayings here. Revelation is always greater than relief. And so this is where many believers pray, Lord, help me to understand why I'm going through this. Help me to see what it is you want me to see in this. Let me learn the lesson in this season, every season has a lesson to it. Lord, have mercy. Every season has a lesson. God will never lead you in a season where there's no fruit. 
the, the lesson is the fruit of the season. And so your prayer ought to be, Lord, let me not come out of this season barren. Glory to God. Let me come out of it with increase. And every increase is not money in your pocket. Uh, that's not always how God is going to bless you. The revelation, let not the, the mighty man glory in his strength, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. But if you want to glory in anything, the scripture says in the Old Testament, glory in this, that you know me, that you know God. The knowledge of God is something to brag about. As a matter of fact, the apostle Paul said, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth unto those things that are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. He wanted to know God more, to know him. This is what his prayer was. You know, I want to apprehend that for which I have been apprehended in Christ Jesus. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection, as well as in the fellowship of his suffering. This is knowing Christ, being made conformable by his death. He wanted to identify with Christ in his knowledge and his experience so that the sufferings of this present time that we all must face, they that live godly in Christ Jesus must suffer persecution. The suffering of this present time, the revelation is this, they are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. And so this experience of revelation is the blessing of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses nine through 10. My grace is sufficient for thee, my strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul's response is, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. I'm going to give God praise in what I'm going through. I know that there's some people that won't praise God for everything, but the scriptures does say for everything, not just in everything, but for whatever he allows to happen in my life, because all things are working together for my good. I can praise God for everything. It may not be pleasant. It may not be my choice, but if God has chosen it for me, then it's for my good. The psalmist declared, it was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your statutes. Whatever God lets come in your life, it's good. So for 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 through 10, put down, revelation is better than relief. Revelation is better than relief. Let's go on. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28 through 31. That's verse number eight. Isaiah 40, verse 28 through 31. Let's go. Isaiah 40, uh, verses 28 to 31. Has thou not known, has thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, God, the Lord, the creator of, of the end, ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no mighty, he increased strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. My God, my God, the promise. What is the promise that's tied to this verse? They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Verse 31 talks about the promise. But what I want you to take a look at is what's going on before verse 31. Because verse 31 basically sums it all up. Verse 28 it's challenging us to, to, to basically remember what you've been taught. Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard? The prophet is basically, is basically challenging the people of God. Have you been listening? Have you been learning? 
I'm so grateful to God that the Lord filled me with the Holy Spirit on April 13th, 1975. And so it's been a while. But I am so grateful to God for all the lessons that I've learned in my walk with God. Is there anybody that's grateful for the things you've learned? Have you learned some lessons in your walk with God? Are you grateful for those lessons? What the prophet is saying here is don't forget them. Don't forget those lessons. Those lessons are your degrees. Those are your credits in the school of faith that get you to the point of promotion. You got to go through something to get something. There is no getting without giving. You cannot get without giving. You've got to give God your faith and you will get the lessons of a lifetime. As a matter of fact, I want to encourage somebody right now. You may be going through a tough time. You may be going through a difficult season, but I got, I got a word for you. This is going to be the lesson of a lifetime. And by the time this thing is over, you will say to God, I wouldn't have had it any other way. Come on, somebody. My God, my God. The lesson of a lifetime right now. Don't blow this moment. The prophet Isaiah says, don't you, haven't you been listening? Don't you get it? Did you learn anything from what you've gone through? And then he breaks it down. God doesn't come and go. God lasts. He is the everlasting God. He's not a some fly-by-night, fair-weather God. Our God lasts. And it's his lasting ability that allows me to be sustained. Glory to God. The ability, God's lasting ability, he's everlasting, he's eternal. There'll never be a time where he is not. And there'll never be a circumstance in my life where God will not be there with me. His eternal nature is the undergirding strength for my faith. He is the Lord and he changes not. Not only is he gonna always be present, he's gonna always be God. I said, not only will he always be present, but he'll always be God. You know, you have a, a political structure in our government where you've got somebody that serves as the president for a four-year term. He might get elected for a second term. Um, and, you know, there's term limits and all that kind of thing. You got a mayor, you got senators, blah, blah, blah. You know, people come into an office, they hold that office for a certain amount of time. There's a term limit and that's it. They're done. Uh, mayors, um, governors, presidents. OK, what you need to understand is that those roles change. There'll be different people in them. And each person that comes to the table has a different agenda. They have a different plan. And, and you're not going to necessarily know one from the next until you get there. And so there's a certain level of uncertainty and perhaps a little unrest with the change of the guard. Well, that's the G-A-U-R-D. When it comes down to G-O-D, there is no change in our God. And our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it is based upon that unchangeable nature that we have faith and strength. And so Isaiah says, check out your God. Look at God. He is not just the source of power, but he is the, he is the promise keeper. He has all power. He, he's the creator of the ends of the earth. Everything you see, he made it. Everything that exists, God made it. And he says, let me tell you, let me, so that might be above your head. That might be something that's far from you to be able to process and to comprehend the, the, the creative powers of God. Okay. So then Paul, I mean, Isaiah begins to bring it down a little bit to our level, to our human experience. He says, he gives power to the faint. And I know that there's people that are listening on this line that'll tell you they got to a place where they were, they, they almost gave up that they felt like throwing in the towel, but God gave them the strength that they needed to go on. Do I have anybody here that's a witness to that? Has God given you strength when you felt like you were about to faint? It goes on, glory to God. To them that have no might, he increased strength. So let me tell you something here. There are times when your strength is gone. Gone, not going, but gone. 
And the word Isaiah shares here is that to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. There's a download. Glory to God. Lift up your hands and just say, Lord, I receive the download of strength. Lord, have mercy. My God, my God. I'm trying to get through part two tonight. Praise the name of God. Let me just do a little bit of a time check. Lord, have mercy. The download of strength. My God, even the youths shall faint and be weary. So he's pointing now in a practical sense to a, to a group of people who are known for their strength. Young people. He says, even the youth, they will, they will lose their stamina and drop out. Isn't it interesting when we talk about dropouts, it's usually connected with people who are young, dropping out of school, drop out before they complete the course of study. Very interesting. So he says that even the youth shall faint uh, and be weary. They'll drop out. Young men will utterly fall. They'll throw in the towel, but they that wait upon the Lord. So here now, he's looking at us and saying, I don't want you to depend upon your physical ability or what is assumed based upon your physical state. This is not stamina. This is not stamina from me. This is stamina from God. And so when I say the Lord is my strength, I'm telling you the truth. The Lord is my strength. I'm, I'm able to laugh. I'm able to smile. I'm able to rejoice because he's my strength. I'm able to endure. I'm able to roll up my sleeves. I'm able to go to next, the extra mile because the Lord is my strength. You can make it through what you're going through. You're going to come out of this. You're more than a conqueror because the Lord is your strength. You're going to be a brand new person because this experience is going to create a brand new you. It's not going to get rid of what you've learned. It's going to enhance. It's going to refine. It's going to take you to a whole other level in your faith walk. And so uh, uh, Isaiah is saying, let me tell you here what God is going to do for you. He's going to give you something that you thought you didn't have. He's going to reveal something to you that you thought you never knew. He's going to show you something that you've never seen before. My God, they shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. They're going to mount up. You're going to overcome. They shall run and not be weary. You're not going to throw in the towel. You're not dropping out. You're going to mount up. You're going to overcome. You're going to finish. They shall walk and not faint. You're going to be dynamic to understand when to do one thing and when to do the next, and God will sustain you in no matter what state you find yourself in. Whether you're in the running state or the walking state, you're going to be in the blessed state. Lord, have mercy. Woo! I got to get through this lesson. I got to get through this lesson. Lord, I feel the Holy Ghost on this line. Don't you give up. You can stand on the promises of God. You can sit down and relax because God has done the work. And he wants you to trust him. He wants you to trust him. This is where the strength comes from. The strength comes from trust. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion that cannot be removed. Cannot be removed. My God, Let, let's go on. I know I'm, I'm getting excited about this Isaiah verse. Let's go on to Philippians, verse number nine. Philippians four, verses six through nine. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. And these peace of God and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, what Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. These things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Oh, my God. Thank you, Dr. Marbury. The promises that are connected to Philippians 4, 
six and nine. Well, the first thing I have to do is to, this is, verse six basically tells me to sit down. <laughs> sit down. Sit down, sit down, sit down. Sit down. Don't fret. Don't worry. Don't be anxious about anything. Have a seat. Take a seat. Have, have a seat. Have a seat. My God, you, somebody ought to put that in your notes. Just, just when you stand on the promises, you are sitting down. I'm sitting down. I'm sitting. Sit in the presence of the Lord. Just sit there. Don't talk. Don't, don't sing. Sometimes you need to bring yourself to a place of sitting down. That, that's, re that's a rest. That's a rest position. The sit is to rest. And, and, and when you are dealing with the promises of God, I, I, don't, I don't see that there's a, there's a mistake or there's a coincidence between what the promises of God does in the life of a person and the word rest. Because God's promises bring rest. They bring peace. When you are um, a hyper person and you are, uh, you, you, ex you know, you exaggerate things, you, uh, you're easy to flare up, you're not at rest, you're not at peace, you're volatile. And the word of God is a, is, is a calming factor, it's a calming force, almost can be considered, considered as a sedative. It brings you to a place calm. And so what I get out of this, when I was reading Philippians chapter four, verse six through nine, one of the things that's just so profound is that first it says rest to me. It says rest. Careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. So don't just talk, just don't run down your laundry list to God. Thank him in the process of the petition. So connect, always connect praise with petition. Put that in your notes. Uh, Philippians 4, 6 through 9, always connect praise with petition. Never just go and ask God for something without thanking him for it in advance. Prayer and supplication, okay? The idea of, of petitions and requests, you know, prayer is our communication to God. When you speak to God about issues, don't, don't, don't be upset. Um, you know, don't hold back on asking him. You can ask. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be open. For everyone that asketh receiveth, to him that seeketh they shall find, and to them that um, knock, to, uh, the door shall be open. So you want to do the ASK. You want to ask, seek, and knock. But when you do it, do it by faith and with praise. And here he says, Go ahead, let your request be made known to God. Don't, don't be sheepish about it. Don't be nervous. Don't be afraid. You can ask God for something. You know, we used to sing a song, Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. But you can ask God for something. But what I love is verse 7. Verse 7 and verse 9. And I want you to catch this before we go on. Verse 7 talks about the peace of God. Verse 9 talks about the God of peace. And, and both of these are things that are yours. They are with you now. My God. The, the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God is with me now. The peace of God is with me now. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him because he trusteth in thee. Thou wilt keep him. God will keep you in perfect peace. I'm at peace knowing that God knows the end from the beginning. God knows how it's going to turn out from the beginning of this whole situation. God's promise to me is in his word. I'm not dreaming it up. I'm not conjuring it up. I'm not psyching myself out. I'm reading the word and I'm taking God at his word, which will never go back to him void without accomplishing what it was designed to accomplish. And so Paul gives us, um, he gives us the strategy <clears throat> in verses eight uh, and nine. He says, think on certain things and then do them. He doesn't just say think. Verse 8 talks about the things to think on, but verse 9 says that I need to do them. 
those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. This doesn't work unless you do something. And the do is the practice of the word. My practicing the word of God is not to convince God to give me something. I'm not trying to convince God to come true, to be true to his promise. He's going to be true to his promise, whether I'm true to him or not. But my walk, see, this is, you have to understand how to get peace in your life. You got to live right. You got to live right. You can't live in sin and then expect to be guilt-free because the devil will use that guilt on you over and over again. He uses guilt on people who have come out of sin. He tries to play the guilt card on people who have come out of stuff, bring back memories of faults in the past, relationships that they shouldn't have gotten into, things that they did that they shouldn't have done, words that came out of their mouth that they shouldn't have said. The devil will try to run the guilt trip on you throughout any season of your life, trying to bring back stuff that's been cast into the sea of forgetfulness. That's the accuser's job. So when he does that, live right, as, as you are living clean and living right. See, Hezekiah was sick unto death. And the Lord sent the prophet to tell him, get your house in order, you're going to die. Hezekiah turned to the wall and he cried out to God. And, and for all intents and purposes, he was talking about the things that he had done, how he had lived by faith, how he had walked up rightfully before him. And there's nothing wrong with saying that to God, God knows the record, but there's nothing wrong with you bringing it to his remembrance, bringing it up in the dialogue. And because with what Hezekiah did, God sent the prophet back to him and told him, you're gonna have, I think it was 14 more years to your life. So had Hezekiah not made his petition based upon what he had done for the kingdom of God, and it's okay to talk to God about what you've done. It's not about bragging. It's like, Lord, consider my record. This is what I've done. I've, I've done this for you. I didn't do it from nobody's applaud. I didn't do it to become popular. I didn't get conceited when you were blessing me and using me in great ways. I gave you all the glory. God gave Hezekiah more time. God, the relationship you have, see, this is where relationship comes in. This is why you got to walk with God. The, the walk of holiness is not a walk of rules and regulation. It's a walk of favor and obedience based upon love. I am favored because he loves me. I'm obedient toward him because I love him. His favor is on me because he loves me. My obedience is toward him because I love him. If you love me, keep my commandments. My obedience is tied to love. I love him. I don't want to hurt him. If you love someone, you don't want to hurt them. You don't want to bring harm to them. And so it's not inconceivable to consider in your relationship with God that the reason you don't sin is not because you want to be like everybody else. It's not because you, you're trying to earn brownie points with God. It's not because you're trying to walk around like a holier than thou. No, my brother, no, my sister, we're not holier than anybody without the blood of Jesus. Our holiness is connected to Jesus. Without Jesus, we're, we're holy in sin, totally in sin. W-H-O-L-Y, totally lost, totally outside of the blessings of God. But through Christ, Christ has set us free. His blood has redeemed us from death and destruction. And we are holy because God has made us that through what Christ has done. So my holiness is connected to my love for God. Woo. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me. Paul is pointing his readers, the saints at Philippi, to his example. Your life matters. How you talk to people, it matters. The words that come out of your mouth, it matters. Your body, how you treat your body, how you use your body, how you allow things to be done to your body, 
what you put into your body, all of this matters to God. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. If any man defile the temple of God, the temple of Christ, him shall God destroy. We are his holy people. Not to, holy to get blessings, holy to walk with him. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who will go into the, you know, you, you, you can't go into the presence of God unless you have clean hands and a pure heart. David said, created me a clean heart. He understood what was separating him from God. It was, it was a heart issue. His fleshly desires is what got in the way of his relationship with God. And so he prayed, Lord, give me a clean heart. I want my heart right. Because if my heart is right with you, then my body will go in the right direction. If my heart is right with you, then I'll learn your statues. I'll take your yoke upon me. I'll learn of you, and I'll come to know that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. In other words, your way, God, is right. It's the devil's way that brings burdens, not God's way. God's way doesn't bring guilt. That's the way of sin. God's way doesn't bring hardship. All the promises of God in Christ are yea and amen. And every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variableness, neither is there shadow of turning. The blessings of the Lord, they make it rich and they add no sorrow. So you need to check it out. Check out what you're doing. If what you're doing is grievous, well, maybe that's not where God wants you to be. I got to get through this lesson. Oh, God, help us, Holy Ghost. Let's go. Uh, verse number 10, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. My God, I, I, I don't know how you feel about the fact of looking at what Christ has done in Scripture and seeing yourself in that word. The history that is recorded in the Scripture concerning what Christ has done for us puts my puts the issue in the past. It's already settled. Lord have mercy. When I read concerning what Christ has done, the finished work of his death, burial, and resurrection, the redemptive story of God, it's complete. And we are complete in Christ. Follow me here. We are not looking forward to God doing something. Come on, now. I, I, let me stay close with me here. We are trusting in the finished work and the benefits showing up in our present life. We are confident in the finished work and expecting the benefits to manifest in our lives. Woo! We are standing in confidence on a finished work. What God has done, it's done. There ain't no more doing it. It's done. Ah. Uh. When we look at this, let me put this in the context of the Genesis account. But everything we experience in this life, it has its or origins in the book of Genesis. God was working for six days. And the seventh day, God rested. He established the concept of the Sabbath rest. When the work was completed on the seventh day, God rested. Follow me. God didn't make man on the first day, did not make man on the second day, not the third, not the fourth, not the fifth, but the sixth day. Follow me. Man was made on the sixth day. Man was not around for the works. 
the sixth day, God stopped working, and the seventh day, God rested. Man was created on the sixth day. On the seventh day, he didn't come into works. He came into a finished work. Now, I know he was given responsibility to keep the garden. He was to maintain it, but he didn't build it. God brought man into a finished work. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you come into a rest. Lord, have mercy. Because the Lord has completed the work. Adam's first day, his first day on the job, he came into the Sabbath. The Sabbath was his first day on the job. His first day on the job was the rest day. The first thing he came into was something that was already done. When you receive salvation, when you repent of your sins, get baptized in the water in Jesus' name and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the biblical evidence of speaking with other tongues, you enter into rest. The first day of your salvation, you enter into rest. Everything has already been done for you. Ha <laughs> ha, hey, hey. All the work has been accomplished. Salvation has been perfected. And God basically welcomes you into rest. Welcome into rest. When we look at 1 Peter, the believers are encouraged to put, to have their point of reference at something that was already done. Not something that they would look forward to. Not something that was coming soon. Hey, 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 glory to God. But something that was already done. He talked about Jesus Christ and he said, who him, his own self bear or bore our sins. And that's, that's in the past tense, our sins in his body on the tree that we being dead to sins now, this is our state right now. Okay, we have come to Christ, turning our back on the life of sin. Sin is, we're dead to sin. We're alive unto Jesus Christ through the new birth, through the new birth. And so the past, Christ did the work for us in the past on the tree. Presently, we're dead to sin. Sin is behind us. Righteousness is before us. And what Peter is saying is you're walking into your benefit. The benefits are, are here for you. By whose stripes, Christ's stripes, ye were healed. Ye were, this was already provided for you before you got here. Let me give you this last example, and then we're going to quit. When you get a job, and there are some jobs when you come in, you go on probation for a period of time. But there are some jobs where, um, uh, and, the, and you get full benefits after the probationary period. But there are some jobs when you join, the first day you are in the employ, the benefits are available to you. They're yours on day one. It's not benefits that are coming. It's benefits that are here. It's benefits that, for all intents and purposes, were already in the company before you got there. So when you came on board and you got hired, you're stepping into something that was there before you got there. How? Why is it so hard for you to understand that what Christ has done is just like those benefits on a job, just like the, the, the benefits of graduation, just like the benefits of earning your driver's license? The benefits are there before you got there. Our daughter just got her driver's license not too many weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago. And the privileges that she enjoy as a licensed driver 
did not become in existence when she became a licensed driver. Those benefits and privileges were there before she got there. The moment she got her license, she was able to exercise her rights. The moment you receive the Holy Spirit, you have the right to exercise your benefits. Glory to God. And one of those benefits is healing for your body, healing for your soul, healing for your spirit. And I think it's powerful that the healing for your spirit and your soul take place before the healing of the body. My God, my God. I got to let this go. I'm going to give you these extras. I had a, a bunch of other verses that I want to share with you tonight. But I'm going to uh, roll it on the screen so you can see it. I think there's about maybe 14 other verses that I wanted to give you because I want you to build an arsenal. I want you to build your repertoire of the word of God. Mark chapter 11, verse 20 through 24. Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. Psalms 37, verse 4. Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 through 33. Luke chapter 11, verses 9 through 13. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 through 39. Proverbs 18 and 10. Isaiah 43 and 2. Isaiah 54 and 10. Isaiah 54 and 17. James chapter 4, verse 7. John chapter 8, verse 36, and Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. I want you to know what your rights and privileges are in God. And it doesn't have to wait until you get old to start learning this. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not turn from it. This is a promise. This is one of those promises. Proverbs 22, verse 6. Submit yourselves there then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. James chapter four, verse seven. Thought this was pretty cute. This is one of God's extra promises as well. When you put God first in your heart and in your mind, you'll be strengthened to fight the devil. Problem with weakness is, an un, is, is, is a mind not made up. Mind's not made up. It's double-mindedness. The problem with weakness is double-mindedness. When you are double-minded, you're unstable in all your ways. And that person can't receive anything from God because God wants you to be focused. He wants you to have a single heart. He wants you to have one focus. You delight yourself in me, his promises, and I will give you the desires of your heart. He wants your focus. And so does the devil. Devil wants your attention. And so you've got to decide who will get your attention. Who will get your attention? Are you going to pay attention to God? Or are you going to pay attention to the devil? I'm going to get your attention. I wanted to go into the uh, eight covenants in scripture. Started out with the Edenic covenant. Um, that took place in the Garden of Eden. I'm just putting it on the screen so you can see it. We're not going to get into it tonight. We'll talk about it next time. Um, but I want to just encourage your heart to understand that learning and walking with God is a journey. It's not something that gets done in a day, but it's something that's to be continued, TBC. Trust, believe, and change. This is how your learning comes relevant and practical. You've got to apply this to your life, not leave it on a, a, a YouTube link or a Facebook post or a Zoom Bible study. You've got to take it off the page and put it in your spirit so that you can grow and be what God would have you to be. If you want to be a blessing to the ministry of Beulah Tabernacle, we invite you to sow into the ministry. You can sow in three ways um, by using our website, BeulahTabRocks.org, and go to our giving section. You can give through PayPal there. You can send in your uh, love gifts, check or money order to the ministry by mail. 
Beulah Tabernacle, P.O. Box 10860, Brooklyn, New York, 11210-0806. Again, that's Beulah Tabernacle, P.O. Box 10860. I know it's a lot of zeros. Brooklyn, New York, 11210-0806. Or you can bless the ministry through Cash App, dollar sign, Beulah Tab Rocks. You can send your tithes or your free will offerings to support the ministry work of Jesus. Um, we are grateful to God to be a part of the kingdom work and glad that you're a part of it with us. And so we want to pause at this time, posture ourselves for what's next. And I say this with no coincidence or premeditation. Prayer always postures you for what's next. Come on, somebody. My God, I, I, I'm going to say it again. Prayer always positions you what's next if you want to understand the will of god if you want to know what god has next for your for you in your life the prayer position is the posture for preparation for what's next in our lives my god my god it's time to pray jesus answered and said unto them have faith in god for verily i say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart and shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. Here's the promise. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever you desire, whatever you desire, and you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. It's time to pray. I'm going to ask that you would bow your heads with us. Woo, my God. Father, right now, we bless you and we thank you. We thank you for family. We thank you for family, for the family of believers, for the family of God, for our natural families. Lord God, I praise you for me, familia. I praise you for my brothers and sisters. I thank you for those that are here with us tonight, even right now, for our mothers and fathers of faith our aunties and uncles of faith and those that love us dearly, our sons and our daughters, Lord God, our parents, I praise you right now. Lord, I come against any lazy spirit. I come against the spirit of laziness that would cause us to defer putting time on our agenda to be with you. I come against that spirit, that demon right now. I come against the spirit of excuses. Lord God, we're not going to make excuses for the flesh. We're going to progress in the Holy Spirit. I praise you right now for progress in the Holy Ghost. Lord God, we're not going to make excuses about who has hurt us or who said something bad to us or who didn't make us feel welcome. Lord God, we know the devil goes about like a roaring lion seeking the vulnerable, seeking the easy to take down, seeking those who are easy prey. I pray now in the Holy Spirit, hey God, that you will help every person that's listening to this prayer right now understand that they will not be easy prey. Let it be a confession. Let it be something they write in their notes. My life will not be easy prey for the devil. My body will not be easy prey for the devil. My mind will not be easy prey for the devil. My emotions will not be easy prey for the devil, for I am fortified by God. Thank you, Lord, for Holy Ghost fortification. Thank you, Lord, for the strength that abides within your children. Greater is he that is in us and he that is in the world. I praise your name for the right now blessings that belong to us, every benefit, Lord God. Just like Isaac walked into the blessings of Abraham, so do we, oh God, for Christ was re Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles, through Christ Jesus, the blessings just come on us. Ah, God, the blessings of divine favor, 
the blessings of our adoption, the blessings of our redemption, the blessings of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. My God, I thank you. We just walk into them because they were there before we got there. And even now, we are, you cause us. Lord, I bless you. I bless you. You're speaking even now. You raised us up together and made us to sit together, to sit, to sit, to repose, to relax, to chill out in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I praise you for our, our place and our position in Christ. I praise you right now that we are in a finished work. I praise you right now that when Jesus said it is finished, there was nothing left to be done. It is all finished. And so, God, I pray now that the spirit of revelation would come upon these precious hearts, that they will discern the power that rules within our hearts as we stand on your promises. Oh, God, I thank you. The power that worketh in us, it's the power of the Holy Ghost. It's the power of your spirit. It's you, Lord. It's you working in us both to will and to do of your own good pleasure. It's you, Lord God, that's working in us. You, Lord God, that's reminding us of how special we are, how, how selected we are, how chosen we are, how destined we are. I speak this word over every person listening to me. You are chosen. You are purposed. You are destined. You are selected. I praise you for divine selection right now. And Lord God, if there's someone listening that has sin in their lives, if there's someone listening that have fallen short of your word and your directives, Lord God, if there's anyone that needs to repent right now, I thank you, Lord, that they can do that right now, that they can say that I'm sorry that they can open their heart to you. You said, if we confess our sin, you're faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse from all unrighteousness. Spirit of the living God, you know the need right now. I thank you for healing on this line. I thank you for, for forgiveness on this line. I thank you for your anointing on this line. And so now, Lord God, I pray this prayer over these choice individuals. Woo! Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and to be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. May he smile upon you and give you peace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Till we meet again, God bless you. God bless you. In Jesus' name. Take the limits off God. Possess the land and stand on the promises. Stand. Stand. God bless you. See you next time.